On October 12, 1972, a small chartered plane takes off from Uruguay, South America. This plane was going to Santiago, the capital of Chile, and some rugby team players were sitting in it. A total of 45 passengers were on the plane, and some of the players' family and friends were also on board. The flight wasn't supposed to be very long, usually just three hours from Uruguay to Santiago, but the giant Andes Mountains are interspersed along the way. The Andes Mountain Range in South America is the longest mountain range in the world and the highest mountain range after the Himalayas. It is these hills that pose a terrible challenge to these passengers in this story. On October 12th, a storm hits the hills, causing the plane to be unable to proceed. The pilots decide to stop en route and try to fly again the next day. The plane is landed for the night in Mendoza, Argentina. The next day, October 13th, the plane takes off again at 2.18 p.m. The weather was clear, and the journey was quite pleasant for the next hour. At 3.21 p.m., the pilots begin to descend the plane. The plane was approaching quite close to Santiago, but was still in the hills because the city is surrounded by very high hills. While descending, a sudden, terrible turbulence is seen, the plane starts to shake up and down very quickly. At the same time, a lot of clouds come around, but nothing is visible. Suddenly, the alarms start ringing in the plane, and the warning lights start flashing and no one understands what is going on. A passenger looks out the window and sees that the clouds are slowly moving away, but then sees that the hill is very close. As the plane emerges from the clouds, the pilots notice a large rock in front of them. In a hurry, the pilots try to turn the plane upwards. The aircraft's ground collision alarm sounds very quickly. Pilots apply maximum power to gain altitude to escape over the hill. But alas, it was too late as the back of the plane crashes into a hill. As the plane hits the hill, the entire back part of the plane separates. The rear two seats are thrown out of the plane and the three passengers disappear into the air with it. For a few more seconds, the plane keeps going up and then suddenly it starts falling down. A few seconds later, another collision occurs and the left wing of the plane is also broken. Some more passengers are thrown out of the plane and fall down, and now only the front portion of the plane is left, which goes straight and falls into a glacier. At a speed of 350 kilometers per hour, it continues to slide on the glacier and descends 700 meters and finally makes a last impact. Everything in the plane is destroyed. The passenger seats are thrown from the base of the plane, the cockpit of the plane is completely crushed, and the two pilots are killed on the spot. This plane is now lying broken on an unknown hill in the Andes, at a height of 3,570 meters. Amazingly, 33 of the 45 people on board the plane were still alive and survived the crash. The only problem is that many of them are injured, and no one knows where they are? And this painful story of survival has only just begun. Neither those people could imagine at that time, nor you could imagine at that time, what happened next to these survivors. This is the heartbreaking story of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. Immediately after the crash, there were two survivors who were not seriously injured. 19-year-old Roberto Canessa and 20-year-old Gustavo Zerbino are both medical students, so they set to work to see who is alive and how to help the sick. Both of them see that there are many passengers who have suffered severe injuries. One of the passengers is 23-year-old Nando Parado, who is now in a coma due to a skull fracture. As much as they can, these two medical students try to help the remaining survivors. On the other hand, within an hour of the plane's disappearance, the Chilean Air Search and Rescue Service was notified and four aircraft were deployed to search for survivors. From dusk till night, they try to find the crash site, but unfortunately, they find nothing. Rescue service officers listen to radio transmissions and conclude that the aircraft must have crashed in a very remote and inaccessible area. The problem was that the plane was a white color and it crashed in a place where there was white snow all around and it was very difficult to find it in the snowy mountains. On the night of October 13th, the remaining passengers were very hopeful. They hoped that somehow they could spend a night here, find some way to escape the cold, and the next day, someone would find them. 
Five injured passengers cannot survive this snowy night. Now only 28 survivors were left. These survivors use the body of the plane as a shelter. Luggage seats and ice are used to close the back of the plane to keep everything warm inside. The next day, October 14th, 11 separate planes from Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay embarked on a search operation. The search area they chose was correct. The location of the crash site was also present within the same search area, but still they could not locate the crash site. Survivors try to use lipstick to write SOS on the plane's roof. They start writing, but quickly realize that there is not enough lipstick to write all the letters. They then try to use suitcases in the snow to make a large cross so that the search aircraft hovering above will see them, but soon realize that it's not working. That day, they see not one, not two, but three airplanes flying overhead. These people shout and wave their hands and try their best to get them to notice them, but they can't. Another day passes in the same effort. The next day, October 15th, the survivors realize that they need water to survive. A passenger named Fito Strauch finds a way to drain the water by using a sheet of metal as a collector, which concentrates sunlight to melt ice and collects water droplets in empty wine bottles. Along with this, many passengers start using the mattresses on the seats like snowshoes, and the wool in the seat covers is also used to protect themselves from the cold. Next day, October 16th, Three days after the crash, Nando Parado wakes up from a coma. When he regains consciousness, he finds that his mother has been killed in the crash and his 19-year-old sister is severely injured. Parado tries his best to keep his sister alive by bringing food and water for her, but as the days pass, eight days after the crash, his sister also passes away due to her injuries. Most of these passengers lived by the sea and had never seen snow before. And now all of a sudden, they were surviving here at such a high altitude in minus 30 degrees Celsius cold without proper food and water. In these bad conditions, there was another problem, and that was snow blindness. When the sun's ultraviolet rays reflect off the snow on the hills, it can also damage the eyes, a condition known as snow blindness. These survivors had only three pairs of sunglasses in total, on October 21st, eight days after the crash, search and rescue teams give up. They feel that if no trace of a survivor has been found in eight days, then there is no point in continuing this search operation. There is very little chance that there will be any survivors after so many days, so after 142 hours of search operation, the search operation is officially called off. Meanwhile, the survivors find a transistor radio lying between the plane's seats. Roy Harley, a survivor rugby player and also an electronics enthusiast, tries to tinker with the radio and improvises a large antenna, and with some hard work, the radio finally works. This radio could only have one-way communication. The survivors could hear the outside, but could not transmit any messages on their own. They all listen to the radio 11 days after the crash and find out that the search operation has been canceled. Some people start crying after hearing this news. Some people start praying to God. Feeling that their world is alive and they consider you dead. Fernando Prado was the only one who didn't react too much after hearing the news because he had something else planned in his mind. By the 11th day, the survivors were starving for food and they didn't have much food anyway. In the beginning, there were only eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three small jars of jam, a box of almonds, some dates, some candies, some dried plums, and some bottles of wine. A few days after the crash, they all began to consume all this food, little by little, eating very little every day. Parado ate one chocolate-covered peanut for three days. By the 11th day, the food was completely gone, and some people tried to eat parts of the planes, like the cotton inside the seats and the leather on the seats, but this made them even sicker. In such a situation, when there was no other option but to die of hunger, these survivors did something that will blow your mind. They all decided that there was no other way to survive than to eat the dead bodies of their friends and family. It was not an easy decision to make because most of the people who were killed in the crash were friends, classmates, family members, or relatives. The idea first came to Roberto Canessa, and he was the first to try it all. 
Some people tried to eat them, but they were not digested at all. Some people forbade it at that time. But when two days passed and no other option was shown, finally they also made human meat their food. Sixteen days after the crash on October 29th, this food source for the survivors was also decreasing rapidly. But then that night, they hear a huge roaring sound. It turns out that an avalanche has suddenly come. Heavy snow falls from the top of the hill so fast that the plain is completely covered with snow. Eight people get lost in the snow and die due to lack of breath. Now only 19 survivors remain. These 19 survivors are also buried in a small space inside the ice. Parado uses a metal pole to create a hole in the ice that provides some ventilation. After working hard for two days, they dig and make tunnels through this ice, and with great difficulty, they can come out on the surface. As soon as they get out, they suddenly realize that a snowstorm is coming, and it would be wise to go back into the snow cave to survive. For the next three days, the remaining survivors remain inside the plane. After three days, they come back to the surface when the weather clears and they come out and realize that there is no one to save them. They said that if they want to survive here, they will have to do the effort themselves. There is no point in sitting here on a crash site and hoping for help. Canessa, Parado, and Vizentin were among the strongest survivors, so everyone decided to give them a little more food rations and the warmest clothes. Because these people will try to get out and find help. The first task was to determine the location. Before the crash, the pilot made a statement that his plane had passed the city of Curico. So these people guessed that if these people walk a few kilometers in the west side, they will definitely reach some countryside area of Chile. But this assumption was very wrong. Originally, their crash site was 89 kilometers east in the Andes Mountains. And on November 15th, 33 days after the crash, these three men set out to find help. After hours of drifting eastward, they find the tailpiece of their own plane down. It was the same part of the plane that was already broken. Inside they find several suitcases, some boxes of chocolates and some food boxes, a bottle of rum, extra clothes, comic books, and some medicine. And at the same time they get the aircraft's two-way radio system, a radio that can not only receive incoming communications, but also send messages out. They decide to spend the night here. The next day, they think they should try to activate the aircraft's radio. They believe that they would try to activate the radio by removing some batteries from the aircraft and then send out their SOS call. They also found batteries in the oil compartment, but these were too heavy to be carried back to the plane's main body crash site. So they decided to try to activate it from here and go back and take the help of Roy Harley, who had a little knowledge of electronics, but unfortunately, this plan was not going to work. The fact was that the aircraft's electrical system operated at 115 volt AC, and they had no way to connect the battery they had, which was 24 volt DC. For a few days, they try their best to activate the radio, but soon realize that there is no other way to survive, so they have to start walking in the direction of the west. On December 11th, 59 days after the crash, another avalanche occurs. Three more survivors are killed in the avalanche, leaving only 16 survivors alive. Climbing the hills in the direction of the west, they needed a way to sleep at night, because it was very difficult to survive the night in the cold of minus 30 degrees Celsius. Among the survivors was an 18-year-old boy named Carlos Miguel Rodriguez, he remembered that his mother had taught him to sew with a needle and carried his swing kit with him. His idea was to stitch separate pieces of clothing together and make a large sleeping bag. Then the same is done. The next day, December 12th, two months had passed since the crash. These three men, Parado, Canessa, and Vizentin, set out to climb the glacier without any mountain ring gear. Going west meant they had to go up the hill first before going down. They still thought that these people were only a few kilometers away, so they hoped that they would walk to find help within two days, so they had packed only three days' supply of meat. To avoid the cold, Parado wore three pairs of jeans, three sweaters over his t-shirt, and four pairs of socks on his feet, and a plastic shopping bag on top. They had no technical gear, no map, no compass, and no climbing experience, and at such a height, the lack of oxygen begins to be felt, but still, 
they kept going. The sleeping bag they stitched together worked at night, and during the day, they slowly moved forward. These three people slept in a sleeping bag as close to each other as possible and started walking as soon as the sun rose. Gradually, step by step, they progressed. The second day came, the third day came, and on the morning of the fourth day, they realized how wrong their estimation was. Further, they see that this path does not end. Due to the lack of food, Vizintin decides to turn back and go to the crash side, leaving the two survivors to move forward so that less food is needed. On the 15th of December, Vizintin goes back through a very easy route, as it was downhill all the way. He uses the aircraft seat as a crutch, and within an hour he is back at the crash site. It took them three days to climb the hill, and Vizintin was back at the crash site in just one hour. Parado and Canessa continue to climb the hill. After three hours, they reach the peak of the hill and see that all around are hills. Nothing but snowy hills. Parado tries hard to see if anything else is visible. Then, in the far western horizon, he sees two mountain peaks with no snow on them. These people figure that they should keep traveling in the same direction and not give up. Parado and Canessa continue their journey for several days. Finally, they reach a valley. They see a river flowing. It was a great relief to reach the river in such a situation. Because it was easy to find a downhill path while traveling in the direction of the river, they keep walking and walking, and finally, on December 20th, after traveling for nine days, they see some human presence. They were so tired at that time that they couldn't go any further, and then three people were seen sitting on horses on the other side of the river. Nando Parado tried to shout, but the noise of the river is so loud that they cannot hear. But luckily, one of the men sees Parado and Canessa, and looks back at them and shouts, Tomorrow! He says, I will come again tomorrow. The next day, the man comes again on the horse, and this time he brings some paper and pencil with him. He attaches the paper to the stone and pencil through a thread and throws it to the other side of the river. For the first time, Parado gets an opportunity to convey his message to the rest of the world. Parado writes in Spanish on this paper, I come from a plane that crashed in the mountains. I am Uruguayan. We have been walking for 10 days. I have 14 friends wounded on the crash site. We need help. We don't have any food. Please come and get us. On the other hand, the recipient of this message was a farmer from Chile, Sergio Catalan. He reads the note and signals to them that he understands. After talking with his other two colleagues, he remembers that two months ago, he heard in a news that a plane had crashed. After knowing this, they are shocked. They do not believe that there is still anyone alive from the two-month-old plane crash. Sergio throws a piece of bread to the other side of the river, and for the next ten hours, they continue to ride in the direction of the west on a horse. They were still so far away from any human village or city. Finally, when Sergio reaches a nearby city, the news is reported to the army command there, who contacts the army headquarters in Santiago. Meanwhile, a man takes Parado and Canessa on horseback to the city of Los Maitenes. It turns out that in the last ten days they had traveled 61 kilometers on foot. Canessa had lost half of his body weight. Only 44 kilograms was left. The Chilean Air Force sends three helicopters to perform an emergency rescue. Army officers interview Parado and Canessa to ascertain location information. Army officers take them in a helicopter to locate the crash site, and with their help, the survivors are finally located. On December 22, 1972, 70 days after the crash, two search-and-rescue helicopters arrive to rescue the remaining survivors. Total 16 survivors are rescued from here. The condition of these survivors was very bad. This story is a lesson for the world that if you decide to do something and you have patience and courage, then nothing is impossible. If you want, you can achieve things that you can never even imagine in your dreams. That's why this disaster is also called the miracle of the Andes.